Hello and welcome to another episode of the Compile Swift podcast. I'm your host, Peter Whittem. In this podcast, we talk about everything related to Apple platforms and Apple development, including macOS, iOS, iPadOS, watchOS, tvOS, and any other OS they've invented this week. So with that, let's get on with the show. What's up, everybody? We are at the end of 2020. Can you believe it? We have got about a week to go here, and we're going to be into 2021. And I think that's going to be a lot of good news for a lot of us who just want to see the back of 2020. Now, let's talk about it from a development perspective this year. I think that as far as developers and the Apple platform, it has been quite a year, an amazing year at that. You know, just to recap a few of the things that we've had, and this is kind of a recap episode here for the end of the year. We've seen, you know, the new releases of the OSs. We've got Big Sur, which is, I personally feel, a much better initial release than, you know, some of the previous years. Uh, It's been working good for me. Sure, there's been a couple of bugs, and we've seen a couple of point releases. But in general, I've been very impressed with it and very happy with it. On top of that, you know, we've had a new iPad OS, a new iOS, which I really feel have brought the platforms forward this year. You know, Apple, in my opinion, was starting to fall behind a little bit. And I think that they've played a lot of the catch up this year. A lot of what we've seen are features that we've wanted. Uh, For the first time, I would say arguably in the history of iOS and iPad OS, we've seen changes to the home screen. Now, by that, I mean visual changes, right? You know, of course, there's always changes under the hood. But, you know, essentially, the the iPhone and that has always looked the same since day one, right? This grid of, of icons. So to have these interactive widgets now of different sizes on the home screen, I know I'm using them. I know other people are using them. And it really... I don't want to say it's a game changer because, you know, other platforms like Android, it's something I've always appreciated. But on iOS particularly, you know, it is a game changer because we don't have to go off to the side screen and have a special area for widgets. You know, much like we used to have a separate screen on the Mac before they killed off the dashboard. So, you know, that's a big step forward. There's been a lot of advancements under the hood this year as well on those platforms. You know, watchOS, of course, has continued to progress, but I always feel that's kind of, I don't want to say limited in a bad way, but you can only work with, you know, the hardware that you've got there, right? You've got the screen sizes and so on. There's, you know, watchOS, I think, is arguably not quite there yet, right? I think it's got a few more releases before it, it finds its its place in the platforms, as it were. You know, on top of that, of course, we've got the Apple TV as well, which continues to go strength to strength. You know, looking forward to seeing new hardware there. I still feel Apple has a bigger agenda there that we've yet to see come to fruition, but they're making good strides. So I think that on that side of things, from a platform perspective, it's been a phenomenal year. You know, looking at the tool set, Xcode 12, you know, anytime we get a new major release of Xcode, it's always, I hesitate to use the word problematic, but there are always growing issues, I think is fair to say with the tool set, right? You know, Xcode 12, again, to me this year, uh, I feel even through the betas and into the final has been really good. There are some difficult parts in there that, you know, occasionally I hear bugs on. But if you look at some of those features that they've put in there, like the live previews, with you know the new way that they they can render out using Swift UI the views and you can change them in real time, that's that's no small amount of work, right? That is some massive under the hood engineering. And I think you know we got to give them a break there. I think you know by the time we get to say like Xcode 13 or something, when those those new features have really been worked on and baked into the platform, the the tools, it's going to be you know, something that we just take for granted, but there is no small amount of work went into that. So kudos to the the Xcode teams for, for working that out. I feel Xcode is still one of my favorite IDEs. Uh, you know, another one that I like a lot, of course, is uh, Visual Studio Code. Uh, you know, that's one that I use. And I feel like Xcode is, is definitely, you know, my go-to tool, no question of that obviously, for Apple development. 
But I do use other two tools. You know, we have like App Code and so on, which has seen vastly improved uh, support for Swift UI this year from JetBrains. I, in general, I just love the whole JetBrains ecosystem. Um, I think they do really well, and that I feel like those teams work really hard on those tools as well. Time for a break. When I was looking to get started creating my own podcast, I looked at lots of different services, and I found the one that worked best for me was Anchor.fm. And the reason being is they do everything for you. All you need to do is go to the app stores and download the mobile app, or you can go to their website at anchor.fm, that's A-N-C-H-O-R.fm, and you can get it set up there. Basically, you just answer a few questions, and within minutes, you've got your own podcast stream set up, ready to go. They also handle lots of monetization options for you, and take care of all of those details to get sponsorship for your podcast, and basically give you everything you need in one tool, either on the website or the mobile device to get started. So I would recommend going to anchor.fm today to get started creating your own podcast and sharing with the world. Break time over. We, we can't not talk about hardware, right? You know, of course, we've seen, you know, iterations on platforms like the watch and things like that. The two big things that stand out for me, and I'm sure for most of us this year, you know, firstly, let's talk about the iPhone, right? It's got... The, I got the iPhone 12 Pro Max because the design, the physical hardware design is exactly what I wanted it to be, right? You know, other than the USB-C port, but, you know, maybe that's a conversation for another day. The design, though, is very much like the iPhone 5, which has all, always been my favorite. Nothing to knock against the, the designs in between, but I really feel like they just got too obsessed with curves and it was really, you know, form over function for a lot of it. So, you know, going back to the squarer feel, not only does it feel like you have the device more solidly in your hand, but it just looks, you know, to be frank, it looks super sexy, right? When it's sitting on a desk. I just love that look with the square edges. I, I absolutely love my iPhone 12 Pro Max. I don't regret getting that one. That nice, you know, gorgeous big screen and big feel, big design feel. And of course, the camera, you know, as a photographer as well, that camera is just stunning on any of the devices, but in, in particular, the Pro Max. So, and I also, again, feel that iOS has really, you know, helped grow that new design and, and make it uh, as functional as it can be. You know, beyond that, of course, we have the Max, right? You know, we have that new M1 chip, which I don't recall a year in which so many people have praised, you know, new Apple uh, Mac machines. You know, normally there's some kind of caveat or, you know, they've, they've never been as well received as they were this year, as best as I can recall, certainly in recent history. Those M1 chips, just unbelievable performance and just, you know everybody's just raving about them i am just totally pumped to see what it's going to look like when apple switches to their chips in say like an imac you know with a stunningly gorgeous 27 inch or bigger according to some rumors screen um you know it's been very hard for me this year to to look at my macbook pro 16 inch all pumped up with its i9 and and not look longingly at the M1 machines that have come out. You know, my biggest complaint about my 16-inch i9, and I get it, it's an i9. So before you write in and tell me, I understand. But that heat, oh my God, it just, it's so unbearably hot sometimes that it's just, you know, and the crazy. And the noise from the fans, and I get it, right? You know, if I want the power, well, there's a price to pay. But that's not necessarily true anymore. Those M1 chips, just staggering performance. So, you know, the next iteration, whichever way Apple chooses to go on the next rollout as they work this two-year plan to switch all the Macs over, there's just it's just so super exciting for everybody. And, you know, I get it. It's kind of a bit of a love fest here for the Apple chips. But, my gosh, I mean, they really are just incredible, right? And the interesting part is other platforms are starting to look at it too, right? We're reading about Microsoft looking at them for their Surface chips, you know, for their Surface platforms and 
things like that. And it's it's a real wake up call, I think, for convention on, say, some of the platforms and some of the vendors like Intel. I think they've got a lot of catching up to do here, and I'm confident they, they will. But in the meantime, you know, sometimes you've really got to break free and, and do things different, right? It's the Apple way. And my gosh, they really got it right this time. So I actually hope other platforms do embrace it. Of course, you know, seeing uh, Windows run on an ARM a Mac, uh, you know, once someone figures out how to make that simple, or maybe Apple does, oh my goodness, having both of those major OSs and Linux as well as options on a Mac, it's just super exciting. Even now, when I run like parallels on my Mac and spin up uh, different platforms, they just feel so responsive. I just... It's just quite incredible what you can do these days with any modern machine. So it's been really quite a year. You know, Swift, we've seen, of course, some releases. On top of that, you know, 5.3 is shipping with the latest X code and that. And I've started converting some of my personal projects over to the latest code base. And it has certainly been a lot simpler than it has with previous years. So I'm, I'm also happy and very thankful for that. You know, personally, I'm diving deep into the the Swift UI uh, way of doing things. That is where I'm spending my time. I'm currently looking at how you work with data with those views, and I'm sure there'll be a whole bunch of new videos for that. You know, talking about that, I, I got uh, lots of ideas for next year. And, you know, to sort of wrap this episode, this end of year episode up, um, I have lots of plans for next year. And I am taking, you know, the Christmas period off here from podcasts and videos and everything else to just not only, I think, like so many of us recover and, you know, de-stress from this year, but also to regroup and look where I want to take Compile Swift next year. A key factor that I always wanted and I have totally failed to do so far is to really embrace kind of a community aspect, I feel, with Compile Swift. You know, I love doing it and I love putting out all the content and I love putting out these podcasts, for example, but I feel the real benefit comes from discussion. And I, I'll be honest, I don't know what it is that I've done wrong, but I want to find a way to really make this a, a two way conversation with everybody. You know, I would love to see other people come on the podcast, be it an interview or, you know, to talk about a project they're working on, whatever it may be, if it is Swift related I would dearly love to help promote your stuff on this podcast. Um, it's such a massively important part of the platforms to me. And the whole idea behind the Compile Swift project is to spread the word, right? And that means, um, you know, other people getting involved uh, if they want to get involved. And I've got some ideas there. Uh, but I really want to hear from all of you. So you can either reach me on Twitter at Compile Swift. You can go to CompileSwift.com. Of course, Compile Swift is just about anywhere else, Instagram and all of that. You know, with that, I think we're going to wrap up the year here and I'm going to step back from my projects for a week or, you know, possibly two. I hope you all have safe holidays um, for those of you that celebrate. I hope you get time to spend one way or another, spend some time, be it in person or, you know, remotely with friends and family. It is so important this year that we we sort of step back from all the stress and anxiety of the year and regroup ourselves because I'm super confident next year is just going to be so much better, so much more fantastic. So with that, you know, step back, have fun, be safe, and I hope your code compiles swiftly.